We've seen incredible improvements when it comes to our camera gear over the last few years. From ISO performance to amazingly good autofocus, cameras have come a long way and helped us to get some shots we never could have dreamed of. But what's next? And what features do you really need to get even better photos of birds? Hi everyone and welcome back to the Bird Photography Show. Before we get into this episode about the future of camera gear, I just want to say a quick thank you to our sponsor, which is Camera Canada. I know that's where I get all of my camera gear and the reason I do is because I get great prices, fast shipping, they always take care of me and they will take care of you, especially if you use the code Bird Photo Show when you put your order in. So if you're in the market for some new gear, be sure to head on over there to Camera Canada. So Glenn, now you just said the new gear is amazing and it definitely helps us to take incredible images, but is it all sunshine and rainbows or is there still some weaknesses in the current gear that you're using, for instance? I think it's human nature to always want a little bit more. I mean, it is amazing how far the cameras have come, but definitely there's some, I would say some fairly obvious weaknesses still with this relatively new mirrorless technology. On certain cameras, not all cameras, but certain cameras, we're still dealing with rolling shutter, more rolling shutter than we would ideally want. So that for yeah. me is one thing that I'd really want to see just be a thing of the past at some point. Stacked sensors in all cameras is definitely a big one that we would want to see, and that should also get rid of these annoying image wobbles you get, especially with Canon, it seems, where the images is just sometimes like warping or it feels like they're stretching a little bit, depending on your shutter speed and the lens you're using. So if that was gone, I think both of us would be very happy. Actually, one of the most frustrating things is, as you kind of described there, is when you get a shot that has just a little bit of rolling shutter, maybe mm. not even that you notice right away, and then only later you kind of realize like, ah, oh, shoot, you know, was the wing actually that wide or <laughs> is that an artifact of rolling shutter? Those are the ones that I really hate. So I would love to see that disappear. There's definitely another area I would like to see improvement upon as well, and that is battery life. Like there's certain mirrorless cameras, especially like the Z9, they can basically shoot all day with one battery and it's not really an issue, so that's awesome. But then there's other cameras like a Z8, certain Canon cameras, they just chew through the batteries like crazy. You can have spare batteries with you, but I definitely prefer cameras where I don't have to worry about changing batteries all the time. Like that's why we have battery grips on our R5s for instance, or why I use the R3 for filming because I can film an hour or two with it without having to worry that my battery sometimes cuts out halfway through. Cause sometimes I put a camera in the back somewhere, do some B-roll, I start shooting and I don't want to have to think every two seconds, is this still recording or has that run out of battery? So I think, longer battery life would be greatly appreciated. And I think it's something that you're especially aware of because you do so much video. You know, I actually find the R5 with two batteries in it is almost always good for a full day if you're doing mostly stills. But if you start doing a lot of video, and the other, of course, problem, again, more with Canon, is if you're doing a lot of video, especially high frame rate, 4K, you might encounter some overheating. So it would be nice, that'd be another one that'd be nice to see in the rear view mirror. No rolling shutter and no wobbles and no uh, overheating. Those would be all things that would be nice to disappear. Definitely. So what are some things that you guys would like to see disappear from the current gear you're using, whether it's Sony, Nikon, Canon, Olympus, or whatever else is out there? Let us know in the comments. Let's talk about some of the things we really wanna see in cameras that might be coming out in the future. What are some of the things that we really hope to see, Jan? What do you think? I think one hot topic that still has made it into all Canon camera bodies especially is the pre-shooting. I think if used correctly and implemented correctly, it's an amazing feature. And I think the new Sony A93 is probably the best example for that, where you can just set it up to certain time before you shoot. And if you put it to 0.1 second, for instance, it will take three images before you actually press the shutter button. I think with pre-shooting, it doesn't make sense if it's a too long time frame because I guess ultimately you still have to focus and also hold down the shutter button for it to actually work. So it's not like if you set it to five seconds, you can have a little snooze, then press the button and you capture the scene. That's not how it works. So you still have to be on target and half press the shutter button for it to actually work. So having a short but nice workable pre-shooting is good. But at the same time, you don't want to use it all the time, do you? Yeah. Like if you think you get 10 extra photos with every photo shoot, like these turns, I would have another 3000 photos of pre-shooting. So that doesn't really work. What are your thoughts on that? The pre-shooting that's in the Canon cameras right now is 
basically useless. You need some customizability, as you say, maybe from 0.1 to 0.5, maybe even to a full second, perhaps, in a certain very, very, very specific application. And you need to be able to turn it on and off on the body on a customizable button with ease. Yeah. So it has to be something you can pick what button works for you that you're like, oh, okay, I'm at this nest. This bird's going to fly out. Okay, here we go. I'm pre-focused. I've turned on my pre-capture and there he goes. I got it. That's what you're looking yeah. for. That's the whole point. You know, not to be using it all the time, but the whole point, and I think... You know, you mentioned the new Sony that that does it well. I don't know about that, but I know that traditionally it's been Olympus that's been ahead of the curve here that's had that feature and they've been really implementing it quite well for a while. I remember trying it on the R7. It was completely useless. You had to do a whole bunch of stuff to make it work. It buffered out immediately. That's another key thing. If the pre-capture causes your buffer to fill, then that doesn't work. You know, you need to be able to still capture that sequence of images. So there's some implementation things that need to happen, but I think it's a feature that we as bird photographers would all love to see as standard in all of the cameras. Do you know what also would be nice? Also from the Sony A93, they have like a speed booster button where you press the button and it goes to 120 frames per second mm. in full raw mode. And you can basically fill up the buffer. That's another cool button. If you have one, you just press it. You know there's going to be a peak action moment. I don't want to yep. miss any bit of action. You click that button, bam, you're shooting it. I think that's also very cool implementation for very high frame rates that we are definitely going to see in these cameras going forward. Because currently, if you have to go into menu, change something, you're never going to do it. And you also don't want to shoot at 120 frames per second all the time because then you just take endless amounts of photos. But having a few programmable button for the pre-shooting and also for like a speed booster kind of shooting. I think that's very good. Yeah, I think both of these are uh, good, great examples of very specific case scenarios. When you're shooting, let's say, you know, this hummingbird's going to come to this flower and he's going to hover maybe and then zoom, off, off he goes. So boom, put the speed boost on, maybe even put the pre-capture on too. And as he flies yeah. in, you got a few extra frames and then he's there, you got 120 frames and off he goes and wow, you nailed the shot. Whereas the way the cameras are now, maybe not so much. So it's a very specific thing of how you would use the camera and just having the feature isn't enough. It has to be usable and they really need to think about how they allow you to turn these things on and off. And you know, one feature I enjoyed, especially on Nikon and Sony cameras is actually that instead of stopping to shoot when you hit the buffer, they actually keep shooting at a mm. lower frame rate. So even if you hit the buffer in Canon, it stops shooting and that can be yeah. very frustrating. In these other brands, it just continuously keeps shooting at a lower frame rate while clearing the buffer. So you never have that where you just press too early, you hit the buffer, you can't shoot anymore, the amazing moment happens, and then you can shoot again and you kind of miss it. With, with those cameras, at least you can keep shooting all the time. So that's another thing I'd definitely like to see in the positive from like other brands that Canon currently doesn't have implemented as well. Obviously, it's kind of almost goes without saying, we would love autofocus to keep getting better. You know, it's already extremely good, but of course, you know, every camera is always like best ever autofocus. So yeah, we'll see. Let's see if they can keep tweaking those algorithms, keep figuring out the, the sort of eye detect and the subject detect. And I'm sure they will, you know, you think about, for example, if we're talking about the R5 that we both use quite a bit, if that camera winds up being four years newer, I would assume that they'll be able to get some new technology into that and make it a little bit better. The other one, which can be sometimes contentious, some people are really keen for this, some people not so much, I would lean towards the keen side, is as long as they can keep the quality of the images and the dynamic range and the noise performance okay, I would love a little megapixel boost if we're talking about the new R5 II whenever it comes out. I would love if they can push it even a little bit because of the croppability. I would love enough megapixels that the camera could have not just a full frame and a 1.6 crop, but a two times crop that was usable. I think that would be really awesome, but we need a few more megapixels to get there. That's definitely different philosophies. I know you like to use the crop mod. It's something that I personally don't like because I feel like it's safer to crop afterwards. I always feel like I would feel so bad if I clip a wing and I was mm. in the 1.6 crop mode. But I guess if you're shooting small birds, it makes it easier for you and the autofocus as well to keep like a smaller bird in the frame. And the only downside with the higher megapixels is that especially for hybrid cameras like the R5, it's actually hurting it for the video. Another area, just if you think about the enjoyment of being out taking pictures of birds, obviously the camera and all the technology is great, but when you have to lug around 600 F4 and the big tripod and everything, gosh, it would be nice to have a bit of a lighter kit. And because 
the ISO performance and the dynamic range has gotten so much better. I would love to see the industry standard shift from the 600 F4 to a 600 5.6. That's what I would really love. One stop slower, but I think that lens, I don't know exactly the physics and everything of how it built, but I think a 600 5.6 could be quite a bit lighter. And so all of a sudden, maybe you have a camera with a few more megapixels that you can sometimes even use in crop mode. That would be amazing. Mm -hmm. And now the Canon has to turn it to 800 millimeter lens. The only thing really missing from the Canon lineup currently for wildlife photographers is actually a 600 millimeter 5.6 or 6.3 DO lens, well under two kilos, nice and small. And I think if we have that, we would be truly very happy because that 600 PF when I used it, it was just mind blowing to me. The image quality, the tiny size, the weight. And what surprised me the most is that it really felt like a true prime lens just in a smaller package like mm -hmm. the backgrounds were still good it was super usable it worked wide open with the teleconverters like everything a big prime lens does basically it was just much smaller and much lighter so i would definitely love to see other brands do something in that regard fingers crossed what about nikon and nikon's got some nice they've added some really nice cameras the z9 and the z8 but they've got some work to do at the lower end of the lineup i would say Definitely. I think they have an amazing lineup of lenses, especially for us wildlife photographers. I mean, you can, there's literally three of everything at each price. Yeah. Point. Like you can pick and choose whatever you want and you get some amazing products, amazing image quality. But yeah, the one weakness is they have two great cameras, which are essentially the same camera in two different body shapes. Pretty so much, yeah. you only really have one standout camera and the cheapest version of that camera is about 4,000 US dollars. So you have well-priced, good wildlife lenses, but any lens you buy almost pushes you into five, six, seven, eight thousand US dollars at least because the only cameras that really work well for wildlife is the Z8 and the Z9 because the autofocus of the other cameras is just not up to the standard of like Canon and Sony. So you're spending a lot of money then. If they could make something like that D500 that a lot of people loved, a nice, really well-built crop sensor camera, I think people would truly have a hard time going past them. Yeah. There is another area, of course, where we're seeing these huge you know, improvements. And that's, of course, in the digital darkroom in post-processing. We've seen, we've talked about it a lot on this show, the incredible improvements in noise reduction, you know, completely changing the game. We have to remember, it's not even really that the sensors are that much better. You know, you open up a RAW file without any pre-processing in Adobe Camera Raw, yeah. and it looks pretty noisy at ISO 6400 or 12,800. But the software, the AI software has just you know, taking it to a new level. As you say, this is what has allowed us to shoot with these slower lenses in darker environments and get amazing photos. Like when we went to that O'Reilly's retreat, retreat near Brisbane and it's just really dark rainforest. It was so foggy. You were trying to oh. get that Whitbird and it was just dark and foggy and crazy high eyes. Oh, the raw file, as you say, it looked like crap, but then you put yep. the pro sets on it, you run it through DX or Puro 3, do your editing workflow that we teach in your ebooks and my masterclass. And suddenly like you came away with a yep. good looking image. I mean, that's mind blowing. I think a DSLR camera wouldn't have even focused in those conditions. No, probably not. No, I mean, you take, forget about all the, the camera technology, but if you remove the, the the good raw programs, whether it's, you know, DxO or Topaz or Photoshop now, you remove that piece of the puzzle and we're, we're, we're quite a ways back behind. You're not using those high yes. ISOs anymore. So now another thing that AI has gotten quite interesting with is in Photoshop, where we start to have things like the generative AI fill it can be cool for certain applications. It's not really changing the way that I edit my bird images, to be honest. The one that recently has gotten a lot better is the little remove tool. I find myself using that quite a lot, not necessarily on really clean background areas, but where yeah. you have like a missing feather or maybe a blade of grass that goes across some fur or feather. And it is just amazing how easy it is to remove distracting elements with that tool. So that is, I would say, quite a jump that we've seen. I definitely had a lot of cases where the new remove tool or the generative I feel really helped me in removing things, even if it's like on the edge of a bird and you'd have to mm -hmm. get an area from another bird and put it on or something. You just put that on and it actually recreates it really well. The only drawback that I have with it is that 
as you say, you can't really use it well on clean backgrounds because the generator for I feel doesn't create any noise. Mm -hmm. So if you have a little bit of noise in the background and you use it, it will just have a totally smooth area. So it's somewhat yeah. visible. If you printed that, you could probably see it. And I have the issue, if I use the remove tool on a clean background, it creates like this little sort of crisscross pattern or something that also doesn't look as good. So on a textured background, it's much better. On the bird itself, you probably wouldn't notice, but on clean backgrounds, the workflow we teach with like the clone stamp and the patch tool is still the best to remove things on clean backgrounds. Or it's always good to know how to do things sort of manually and then add the AI tools as an additional helper. If you only rely on the AI tools, it can be a bit tricky because sometimes they just don't do what you want them to do. Yeah. One area though where it's pretty good is the YouTube covers. I'm using a generative <laughs> AI fill for that a lot because you can easily say like a few of our covers. I'm like, oh, create this beautiful out of focus mountain scene and it just fills it in and we, I can put ourselves on it. And in that regard, it can be very helpful. So I'm definitely not against AI as, at all. I think it's very helpful. If you use it right, it can make your life a lot easier. Yeah, but as you say, the tools, these types of tools will never take you from, you know, not knowing how to edit your images to having a beautiful photo. You have to learn no. the fundamentals and then you actually know your, you know where and how you can use these tools the most effectively to take your images to the next level. So it's critical. You learn great fundamentals and we've got great resources for you there down in the description, Jan's masterclass videos and my eBooks will help you to get those fundamental skills. I think one of the areas where the AI has made the most dramatic improvement, especially for Lightroom users is the masking. Because in the past, one of the biggest weaknesses of Lightroom was basically that you could do global adjustment but it was very clumsy and not very mm -hmm. accurate to do the more targeted adjustment. That's where Photoshop is far superior. I still think it's superior, but now you can do a lot more things the in Lightroom is... because you can simply select a subject and it does an extremely good job with just the one click. So instead of doing elaborative masking, changing the edges, you can do one click. And if you don't do too extreme editing, you can basically very nicely do a lot more targeted editing in Lightroom now as well. And the same in camera or with the object selection tool in Photoshop as well. So definitely made it a lot faster. So what do you guys think about all this AI technology getting into the, the autofocus, getting into the selections in Photoshop? Are you for AI? Are you against it? Do you think that it's, have you been using it to help you get better results? Let us know what you guys think. Cause it is kind of, it can be kind of controversial for me. It's a no brainer. I mean, why wouldn't I use technology and things in this case? As long as you're not, you know, if it gets to the point where you sort of take a picture of a house sparrow and you say, turn into hooded warbler and it turns into something else, that's different, right? But if you're taking yeah. an image and you're simply enhancing it and improving it and it still looks like the bird photo that you took, then I have no problem with it whatsoever. That's just my take. But let us know what you guys think. Speaking about editing, did you bring us an editing tip of the week, Glenn? I sure did. This week in the editing tip of the week, I want to show you guys a few really cool techniques that we can use with one of the brushes in our brush pack. You know, it happens all the time. You get a great shot of a bird and overall everything's pretty good. The bird landed or it's on a nice perch to give you a nice pose. Everything's looking pretty good, but the bird is just sort of missing a few feathers or a few feathers are kind of discolored. And it's pretty tricky if you don't have a good technique to actually kind of sort of colorize those feathers. We've made one of the brushes in our brush pack, it's almost like a magic brush, so that you can go in there and <laughs> add color to those feathers that are looking a little dull. It's the, the beauty is that you're not painting over it, trying to just, you know, it would just be a blob of color. Yeah. It's actually translucently adding color to the feather. So we'll show you a few examples here. Back down in Argentina there a few months ago, I was photographing this black hooded Sierra finch, and overall everything was looking really good with this image but you can see there's just a few feathers missing and I just simply used our um, add color to dull feathers brush and I brushed that in there and now the image looks much better. A few quick examples there of how our brush pack can make your images look much better and it can make it so easy to do these little things, these common little things that you're doing all the time. Making something lighter, making something darker, adding saturation, adding color to dull feathers. These are all the things that are in the brush pack and they will help you to get much better results with your images. 
And of course you can do a lot of these things manually as well, but the beauty of the brush pack is we've all done it for you. You click play and it's all ready to go. There's one more trick while we talk about the editing tips. If you have some sort of missing feathers or for instance, you have a white bird and it just has a little strip of a shadow on the belly, for instance, like a seagull and the light's a bit too high or the wings creating a shadow. You can use your clone stamp between 35 and 50% opacity and then just go into the plumage that has the good color and clone over the shadow at that 50% mark. And it will basically make the shadow disappear and the whole image will look like it's much nicer light. Or if there's a few missing feathers, you can do that to fill in some of the gaps. And that really works quite well. If you haven't done that, try that out. That definitely makes a big difference, especially in harsh light. If you just remove a few shadows, suddenly harsh light looks like soft lights. So it's mm -hmm. so amazing how our eyes often associate harsh light not with the strength of the light but with certain shadows that we see and if we remove some of these we can make it much smoother and nicer looking so there's a few more tips for you guys go practice those at home and let us know how you go down in the description if you've used some of these tools we're telling you about or some of these techniques let us know if they've helped you out we'd love to hear from you but with that said i think now it's time for the photo of the week so the first image i brought i'm very conflicted about but i just couldn't go past these colors mm. on a bird because I just love vibrant colors and that bird has a lot of it. So I really loved it. I'm not actually entirely sure of the name. I'm sure it's from South America and the, uh, some type of barbet. So maybe you can enlighten us. I can indeed this and it's colorful indeed. <laughs> and it's actually called the versicolored barbet. Fitting. And yeah, I love everything about the bird. And then there's a few issues with the photo overall, it's also nice. It has some sort of ant or spider mm. in the beak as well. I didn't even notice that at first. So yeah. it basically has all the elements that make a great bird photo. It's just the way the perch is angled. It makes it a little bit difficult. And then you have the plant growing like exactly out of the back <laughs> of the bird. So I have no idea what I would actually do to this photo if it was mine, to be honest. But I wanted to bring it because it's one of those photos where it's sort of a true standout. The bird is the hero. And maybe sometimes you just have to accept yeah. how things are. You can't do anything else. You have a beautiful photo of a beautiful bird. The perfectionist in me always wants to do something. But here I'm not entirely sure. That's why I thought I'd bring it here and see what you can do. Maybe you could even just remove that one bright leaf going the opposite way to the other leaves on top. This is where even the generative I, I feel will probably do a really good job because it just kind of recreates the other leaves. So you could play around with it, but mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure. Let us know in the comments, what would you do if this was yours? Just leave it the way it is and let's see what Glenn would do. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I think in this case, you'd kind of look at it and you'd scratch your head for a few minutes and ultimately you'd probably mostly leave it how it is and just accept that this beautiful bird at least gave you a relatively clean shot and it landed out in the open. And yes, the the, the foliage behind it is maybe not ideal. And it's not even that, it's not that we, I think it's really important to say that it's not that we just want nothing but super totally clean backgrounds. It's That is not, not at the all. goal. That is not the goal. But when the plants or the foliage is kind of distracting behind the bird or really inter interrupting you from sort of celebrating the bird, that's where the problems come in. But I think here, I, as you say, I would just sort of say, okay, well, maybe we'll get another chance another day and just accept this one for what it is. Do you know, there's an interesting one though. You said you would love to have cameras with more megapixels. And if this was basically full frame, you shot it on a 50 to 60 megapixel camera, one cool way to get a great shot out of this would be to go in for sort of head portrait mm -hmm. from somewhere above where it shows that different cool colors on the belly, clone out the rest of the branch, maybe smooth out the leaves in the background a bit, and you could get away with a pretty epic headshot of that yeah. bird. And that would probably be the only way that I would tackle or that I would tackle this image is have it like this, and then maybe try and work on a cool headshot because the head turn is just good enough. You have the insect in the beak, you have the amazing colors. I think it would be a pretty spectacular headshot if there's enough resolution. And this would be a great example while we are conflicted about the 24 megapixel cameras, right? Because if this, even if this is full frame, you probably can't crop in enough to make it a headshot because if you do that on 18 or 20 megapixels you probably end up with four or five megapixels and then yeah. it's not really usable not quite enough yeah all right so for my first image this week i've brought this really cute boreal owl um by tobias gerd and 
I just think, you know, these types, I've never seen this species, so I'm kind of jealous. And I think these kind of nest cavity shots are always cool where the bird's kind of looking out at you. The bark on the trunk looks kind of cool. They've obviously chosen to just center the bird. He's looking right at you. I think that the image could overall be a little bit brighter, I would say. I don't know what you think, Jan, but I think it's just a cool shot and it's a cool kind of habitat shot. It's, it's sort of a neat image that's that's jumped out at me. I think this would be an image where either get out our brush pack multiple times and use the brighten and darken area brushes, or you can do it with curves as well. You do a few curves where you pull down the highlights and a few curves where you pull up the blacks. What I would probably do is try and separate the bird and the tree a little bit. Because at the moment, the left side of the tree is kind of dark and the mm -hmm. right side is kind of bright, blending yep. in with the bird more. So I'd probably maybe darken the right side of the tree a little bit without removing the whole fear flow of the light, but still darkening down the tree on the right a little bit. And then I would probably ever so slightly work on the bird's face, making that a little bit brighter without looking too crazy. You sometimes see people where they have bright yellow eyes it's crazy bright the whole face mask is like white that's not the owl no so i wouldn't do that but i think just outlining the owl a little bit more by maybe making a tree darker and the owl a tad light i could balance it a bit more or yes. bring a bit more focus on to the bird because again in this image it's cute but the subject doesn't truly stand out when you look at it which is part of the appeal of the photo so exactly. you don't want to take that away you want the owl to blend in with the tree because it kind of looks like the tree but at the same time, if you just change it slightly, you can still keep that effect, but also make the subject stand out a little bit more, I'd say. Totally. My next image is of this eared grebe, I think, from California. And I just love most things about it. I think it's a very striking image. You have that bird with that intense red eye. It's a nice crop. You have that nice sort of transition in the background as well, from the blue to the probably reeds in the background. So that's nice. And then, of course... It just caught that little fish, which looks awesome as well. In an ideal world, I would have loved to not have the motion blur in the tail of the fish because everything else is static in this image. So having that is almost throwing me off. But I know you can't always have everything, but that's probably the only thing I would love to improve on this. I was going to ask you how you felt about the, the because that was the thing that jumped out at me with the two things was, because I agree, it's a great shot. These grebes, these grebes are just begging for headshots because that crazy red yeah. eye the beautiful detail and but the two things when you brought this image up was for me the motion in the tail does not add to this image and the, and the drops eh? the drops exactly so for me i would clone the drops you can't do anything <laughs> about the motion tail but um overall yeah. it's an it's an awesome shot still all right so my next image this week is by kin l fong and I love this species. Sometimes I guess I get swept away by species that I would love to see. These mustached tree swift is one I would really love to see someday. And this is kind of interesting because, I mean, if you can even call that a nest, it's kind of a pathetic little nest. <laughs> but you can see there's a bit of an egg there. So this this guy's sitting. How do they even balance on that thing and incubate and still get off? It's kind of crazy. Um, but it's a beautiful bird. Nice little head turn. Nice background. I, I, I like it. What do you think, Jan? And how do these babies even survive? Isn't this like the perfect little snack presented on an open branch like totally. it's so strange to me unless it's so flimsy that nothing else can land on it or the babies are so tiny no one thinks they'd be a good snack i don't know it's very strange to me i don't actually know do you know how big these swifts are i assume they're kind of normal swallow sort of swift swallow size they can't be that small <laughs> i mean i yeah I, but <laughs> it's just it, confusing. Yeah, see we don't really have words for it it's just sort of Crazy, because it's just mind-blowing how nature works, that tiny yeah. flimsy nest. I know Willy really Wagtails here sometimes have tiny nests like this, but at least they make an attempt to kind of yeah. build a bit of a shape in the nest. This is just, I don't know, just like a little and put an egg in it. Isn't that something cool about nature photography, wildlife photography? When the image kind of begs those questions, it makes you think about the yeah. bird's behavior, the bird's biology, its evolution, and just these challenges that it might have and why. You know, lots of other swifts and swallows make some more impressive, interesting nests. Like why do how can these yeah. guys get how can these guys get away with this pathetic little nest? There's a reason. You know, nature if they're still around after millions of years probably, there's a reason and it works for them. And I would love to know more yeah. about the biology of this bird. And I think that's a really cool thing when a photo draws you in to ask those kinds of questions. Yeah. 
And I think overall the editing, I think it's done very well. The colors on the bird are all separated really nicely. It's really good. There's good detail overall. And also the head turn makes it even more interesting, yeah. I think. With the way the branch is going, if it was going looking the other way, it wouldn't really work. But Definitely. looking back into the frame actually works perfectly well. And it's an awesome photo for sure. All right, Jan, what's your next image? My last image is of this red-cowled widow bird. And I think it's an awesome shot of a spectacular bird in a pretty nice sort of environment. You see a bit of a distant sort of trees and meadow and sky. The sky luckily seems to be dark enough, must be some cloud so that it's not blowing out. If you have the sky in your distant background and it's too bright, that would be very distracting. But mm -hmm. here it actually blends in rather well. I wonder if I maybe would have tried to continue the green somewhat behind the bird as well a little bit. There seems to be like a little sort of U shape around the bird or whatever. So maybe I would have tried to continue the background slightly. And then the only thing I see, there's a little bit of masking issues going on. I think that either darkened the bird or lightened the background and just a few areas on the perch were missed where you can see the background is much darker than around it. And this was one of the areas where Glenn and I said as well, if you do editing, you should always try to make it in a way that it's not very obvious or people can sort of latch onto it right away. And here, I think it's just, a little bit of let's call it sloppy masking potentially because you can see it around the tail and the wing and yeah. between the neck and the perch as well so it might just be an older lightroom mask for instance or one mask where the object selection didn't work very well yeah. and in these cases it's good to know how to manually mask to make sure that there's no weird transitions between like the neck of the bird and the perch for instance this is one where um so oftentimes when you make a selection and you start doing something you can't, you just see the little marching ants, right? So you can't actually, it's hard to sometimes tell, especially where there's branches like this and there's might be little pockets that get missed. But what will tell you when something's getting missed is if you go in Photoshop, if you go into the select and mask area, I love to go in there and then have it, um, the overlay be the red so that it's really obvious. If you see, you know, a bit of the background still poking through, you kind of know that area hasn't been yeah. selected. So yeah, it's one of those things where, I think overall this image is presented quite well, but they just, there's a little bit underneath that one kind of vent feather where it meets with the the rest of the tail. And then of course the obvious yeah. one is that, that gap where the branch just obviously didn't select. So, you know, no big deal. Just go back, try again and brighten those areas up and you'll be having yourself a great shot there. And so you can also test the mask if you just do something really extreme, like you can use your mask, open up a curve and pull it all the way up you'll also see right away if there's yep. any area that's not selected. And I think one area, one thing that stands out about this photo is how amazing the detail is in the black, though. It must have been the perfect light and really good exposure to basically see every single feather in, like, a black bird. So technically, I think the photo overall is really good. It's just gotten a tiny bit sloppy when it comes to the masking. Okay, so for my last image this week by Jayaram Sankar... It is, I also have a soft spot for woodpeckers apparently, and this one is a really beautiful species, <laughs> uh, black rumped flameback. It's even got a cool name. And I love the bird. I think the pose is pretty good. I think the background is pretty good. I just wish maybe it would have had a little bit of a nicer trunk that it was on. I mean, it looks like it's probably working away on that one there. It's just not the most exciting perch in the world. That's my only wish. Everything else I really like about this, this bird. Yeah, I was just looking at it the whole time while you were talking. And <laughs> I think what throws it off is the bit on the tree trunk that looks like it was sawed off mm. because it gives you that yeah. sort of feeder feel or something as well. The easiest would probably just to clone it out and give it a rough outline. So it looks like the whole tree is a lot more gnarly and it's just sort of that broken off tip that it's working on. Mm -hmm. Or you could just extend the whole tree out. This is where the generative AI feel would do a good job as well to keep it going. But I don't know if that's really the aim. I would probably think maybe making it more gnarly is more natural. But that little bit, if that was gone, I think it would help it a lot more it because would. currently as well, it's kind of, you're almost looking at that first for some reason, even though the bird's so bright and spectacular, you're sort of drawn to the left. So I would do some something there but yeah, yeah otherwise it's really good and yeah nice no, that's a good thought i think uh i was actually when i was editing some of my argentina photos i got this beautiful cream backed woodpecker and he went in this 
actually quite a nice um, kind of perch that had this really cool bark and everything. But in some of my frames, you could see where the where the perch, the, the tree had been, you know, chainsawed off. And yep. right away, those ones were, yeah, you would either have to deal with that by extending the perch. I ultimately chose to not present any of those because I just felt like that... Yep that human obviously that human dominated kind of flat edge just kills the image overall yeah. it's almost as bad as having a man-made object like a you know a chain link fence or whatever because you clearly see the hand of man in that chopped off limb yeah and so i think anytime you have that in an image where there's an obviously a human altered thing you really need to think about how you're going to handle that so just something else to consider and on that note, I think it's time to wrap up this week's bird photography show. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to let us know all your thoughts in the comments. Give us a thumbs up for the video. Hit that subscribe button and we will see you guys very soon. Bye. See you next time, everybody.